Okay. So the title is You Use Floppy to So What, which might feel a little spicy. Uh, but don't worry, I have an alternate title to include literally everyone in this room. No one will feel left out. You can really fill this in with anything, any technology you want. <laughs> no one is left out. Like, there's got to be something. Don't even, you can add to this list. It doesn't have to be this list. I just tried, I just put some random shit down. Um, but really, this talk is about stories and how we communicate. Uh, which I honestly think is perfect for Monktoberfest. While you may not be in marketing or write regularly, but we all communicate, and there's stories everywhere. Stories are the way humans convey concepts, ideas, memories, events, emotions to each other, and our days are filled with them. They might be little bite-sized things, like literally, Slack conversations are kind of like stories. Um, others are larger presentations of ideas. And this talk is rooted in a few different things. You know, I, I, I don't want to offend anyone in this room. So like, yeah, the title is a little spicy. But first of all, I want to understand like where this is coming from. It's coming from a love of our industry and the incredible people in it. This place is like no better example of that. Second, it's an attempt to include more while we're building these really great products, tools, open source projects, new infrastructure, and so much more. And this isn't a talk about putting down experience, because you had those experiences, and no one can take that from you. It's more about communication, storytelling, and, and building environments where a diversity of experiences not only exist, but is embraced. And some of these examples might hit a little close to home. I'm guilty of some of them, too. We'll very quickly see that. And so I'm not really calling anyone out specifically. We're, we're guilty as a group. So if you feel called out, I'm sorry. You aren't alone. And there's something I, you really don't think I handled well, like, feel free to come and talk to me about it after. I'd, I'd like to get that feedback. So I want people to get excited, experience joy, um, have fun conversations about technology, but I don't want that to happen at the expense of others. I'm not talking about conversations with your buddies, people you know really, really well in private settings. I'm talking about the conversations that happen in Slack, that happen in our communities, out in the public that others are a part of. But before we get a little too deep, I want to give a little bit of my background. I started out in software engineering um, after getting a computer science degree, and I quickly realized I wanted more than that. Um, so I've been in developer relations for a little over eight years now, typically worked at startups, usually focused on a combination of data, APIs, and tooling. Um, I've been working at PlanetScale as a staff developer advocate for a little over the last two years. It's a MySQL database platform. Um, and I practice a pretty broad form of developer relations on a, on a very small team. Um, I wear a lot of hats, literally and figuratively. Uh, I've got my developer advocate hat, my developer experience hat, my engineering hat, my product hat, my technical product marketing hat, my community hat. Like, I could just go on documentation. Like, the list is very long. But the one thing I've noticed that goes throughout all of these is storytelling. Um, it might be talking to a developer, explaining a new feature. It might be talking to engineering about a feature request from a user. They are all stories. And so my first uh, story that I want to tell with that was I was working with a new grad uh, uh, last year or the year before, and they asked me this question. What came before Vercel and Netlify? And for context, Vercel and Netlify, really popular places today to deploy web applications. And they've kind of partially created this whole new era of how we deploy things on the web on top of serverless architectures. And by asking me, so they were basically asking, how, what came before our current modern web development practices? And my response was, and maybe some of y'all's, what? Like, how? You think they maybe knew a little bit before that, but where do I even begin? Um, some engineers might react in a negative way, maybe even have less respect for them. Screw that. In this situation, my experience was important. I've personally never racked and stacked a server, but I have used managed providers before that, Rackspace, Roku, many of the other paths that are out there. And I couldn't blame them for not knowing. They, the system set them up for this. They didn't learn this in college. They came into an industry and did what everyone else was doing. Go deploy it to this thing. It's really easy. And so I explained it the best I could, but I realized this wasn't going to be the last time something like this happened. I needed to get better at it. So this term I want to focus on is exclusionary nerdery. I think Oktoberfest is a great place about this 
because we are pas all passionate nerds about something. And actually, I heard this term the first time here at Monktoberfest last year. It was from Rachel in her talk about introspection gaps. It was just one bullet on one slide, but suddenly my brain clicked. Like, there are so many experiences I had seen or had that I had no name for, and it was exactly this. So, like Rachel said, in many ways, we intentionally and unintentionally create these factions amongst ourselves. We're totally allowed to be passionate and geek out about things we love, but we need to make space for others in our industry. So people can see themselves in our industry. You know, it's not a contest for who's nerdier by some merits of their nerdery or years of experience. So that, you know, we can build better products that are informed by just not one person's ideas, but lots of people's ideas. And so if you break this down, exclusionary, having the effect of excluding or shutting someone out, enthusiasm for a particular subject, put those together, and so you're having the effect of excluding or someone, shutting someone out with enthusiasm for a particular subject. Important words here are having the effect. Now I know most people generally don't do this on purpose, um, but it is something to remind ourselves before we go into some of these examples, but it's the difference between intent versus impact. It may not be your intent to shut someone out, but it could be the impact that you've shut someone out. So I want to go through just a few examples. There's many out there, but the first one is manual work as a flex. Um, there's a whole new generation of developers out there that have totally different expectations of their tools and technology. Manual work is no longer a flex to them. They don't want to, you know, of course, high learning curves will always exist in certain parts of the industry, but they don't really want to do that for basic things. They just want to build. And one great example of that I have seen is um, you bring up, you're having a conversation about like an email API and someone brings up like maintaining their old email server and all the complexities of it and somehow they're using that to like flux on you that they know more about email because of that and you're just like, cool, I just need to like send an email from this application, like why are we, like we're way over here. But this can be for anything now that there's like APIs and automation for, like it comes up, this like manual work. Again, it's important that you may have had that experience, but be careful how you wield it. Examples, you know, we often have specialized knowledge based on our work. Um, this issue comes up when we, we take the specialized knowledge and then try to create factions amongst ourselves. Maybe it's because of my background, but I find folks who work in the back end generally put down front end engineering um, for various reasons. There's, there's, that's, that's, that's a whole talk. Um, which is ridiculous to me because front end engineering today is like freaking hard. Why should it matter if they don't understand some very specific back end concept? Like that's not their job. Their job is to focus on performance of the actual front end application and all these other things. I see similar things between software and hardware engineers, product and infrastructure teams, and, and, and many more. Now, this is actually the example that when Rachel gave her talk, I thought of first. Uh, reminiscing on old technology, aka every Slack I've ever been in. Um, classic example is, what was your first machine conversations? Um, is someone less than if they used a Commodore 64 instead of the first machine being some random computer in the 90s from Sam's Club, which is exactly was my first machine? Um, the other side doesn't know how to participate. Often it makes it more obvious that you're younger, you have less experience. Um, maybe they try to participate and engage and they get shut down because they just, you know, they're like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about or other things like that. Um, it's a really popular one. Uh, the next one is, uh, there's a little bit of story for this one. Okay, so in the 90s, LAMP stack dominated. So that's Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. It was heavily used server-side rendering, which means all the work was being done on the server-side and then sent to the client like the web browser. In an effort to improve performance, then a lot of client-side rendering started happening, became really popular, and, and so a lot of that work was then being on the browser side. And then, next thing you know, everything's getting slow and the browser's being overloaded. And then, kind of the web development world moved to a more hybrid model, which is more where we are today. And this is where this has been done person comes in. Um, they love to remind everyone, often a PHP developer, they love to remind everyone, <laughs> that this has already been done. 
in the lamb sack days. This isn't new. Why are you talking about this? this is a brand new thing, whatever? Like, yeah, like, cool. But, like, are you pr actually, like, adding to the conversation by saying that? Um, the reality is what is often old will come new again in some form. Um, like, don't, don't be that person. Uh, and then the last one, um, home labs and networking. Uh, <laughs> you have to spend more time around some like infrastructure and network engineers to hear this one. There's nothing wrong about being passionate about it, sharing on social, uh, chatting with good friends about it, but just make sure you're not like excluding other people from it. Despite the fact that I can terminate an ethernet cable, I like to buy off the shelf stuff plug and play network gear. Am I less of an engineer because I don't care that much about my home network? Like, no. So what is the impact? You know, it's making people feel less than. Um, it doesn't actually help people learn. Like, they're not actually getting experience from just these, like, exclusionary nerdery tactics. It creates this unnecessary division between teams and people and um, different people from different demographics. And it just continues the cycle of, of this, that we are not in this together, that we have different experiences and somehow that like divides us. And the impact is also intersectional. I was, I was talking about this conversation with a older white woman in tech, and she pointed out that ageism for non-men is, is different. Women, for example, can't carry that badge of experience sometimes. It manifests itself different than for men. If they reveal that they were working on that Commodore, it could result in different responses from the conversation. All these things are intersectional. They're interconnected between different identities like race, gender, socioeconomic background, if you're a caregiver or not, like the list goes on. And so it's important to remember this isn't black and white. There's many shades of gray here. When I was thinking about this idea of exclusionary nerdery and how I've dealt with it over the years, I thought of this list. Other than this list being technologies that were all created before 2000, like what, what do they have in common? They are my defense mechanisms. Um, they're the things that I realized that I've developed to stay in conversations just to fit in. Should I need these? Of course not. But being represented in tech means that we have to prove our technical credibility at every step of the way. My first programming language was Pascal when it was a little outdated at the time, but that is what I was introduced to. Then I got into some Delphi UI stuff, which was like very ugly. And you know, when people are talking about old UI programming, I, like, I can like bring that conversation up. Um, when I was at IBM, uh, I was using Lotus Notes, which I think has a new name now. They like sold it off. I don't know what it is. But, and then my first database, of course, like working at a database company, so what is your first database comes up a lot. I was like using Microsoft Access 97 when I was like pretty young, creating like fake businesses basically on it because the computer I had didn't have internet connection. And I was just like, cool, what can I do in the Microsoft Office suite? Um, but like these are like the things that I, should I have to ha feel like I have to like have these defense mechanisms? No, but I know other people also have have these too. So this brings us to this question: How do we learn technical history today? GitHub repos they sometimes can tell a good story, although most developers are pretty bad at marketing, so it's iffy at times. Um, but they do tell stories. You can read the commits, the issues, the pull requests, maybe some code comments. Um, rarely a lot of documentation about history and why different things were actually done. But there's always there's something missing there. Formal education, iffy. Maybe if you've done some graduate work, you, you get more into things. But otherwise, it isn't historically been very helpful here. I don't know um, anybody else, but the only probably more historical mention I had was of Thrac 25 in my computer architecture course, and then never again was that ever mentioned, which was a great tragedy. Tragedy. Go read the Wikipedia page. Like, but like, this is like the one example of history in, in all of a whole computer science degree. It's like really silly to me. Uh, museums, books, and blogs. Who's curating the museum? Who's actually representing the whole industry? Who are the ones who have this power? Um, same for writers of books and blogs. Many voices are often missing. People are left out of history. Um, 
who are the actual people consuming it? Like, it's not, it's not really super accessible. And then the most popular form, word of mouth and personal curiosity. Um, these take time, motivation, knowledge that the thing even exists, and, and so much more. I have my own, uh, you know, I've, I've dug down into different things. One of these is uh, within developer experience, there's a lot of talk of time to first hello world. But I never actually knew where Hello World came from. Like, where, where was that create? Like, who did the first Hello World program? Uh, the first time it kind of appeared was in Brian Kernighan's own 1972, a tutorial introduction to the language B. It got more popular in 78 in the C programming language book. But they needed something to make sure that all the components of a language, the compiler, development and runtime environment had all been installed correctly, and there was no standard first program at the time. Um, and he wrote Hello World. It was something, some places say it was based on something about a chicken and egg that he saw that said Hello World, I don't know. But it's, this, it's cool to me because it's this program that transcends history. It's, it's been around for decades. We're still doing it today, but many people don't even know, like, where did that actually come from? Learning technical history of something today, it's just not, it's not super easy. It takes a lot of extra digging, um, and we're just bad at it, really. And so I believe there's a better way to talk about it, to communicate about it. How can we explain technologies and experiences in a useful way? How can we learn about it without having to posture about experience? How can we have these conversations and not be exclusionary, and it's an inclusive and interesting to everyone part of the conversation. Now, I could give you kind of like the traditional marketing lessons on how to tell a story, but I don't really think y'all need to know these things. Um, they're not really useful in, in most people's day to day, but I want something that everyone can use in when, when you're communicating and storytelling. So the first one comes from uh, Recurse Center's social roles. So uh, Recurse Center is kind of like a 12-week sabbatical to kind of hone your practice of becoming a better programmer. Um, they have these social rules that are put in place to help you learn, because that's the most important thing. We want to learn. Um, and a fine surprise is when you act surprised when someone doesn't know something. So similar in my story at the start of the talk. Responding with surprise in the situation makes that person bad for not knowing it makes them less likely to ask questions in the future, and which makes it harder for them to learn. The next time they have that question, they're, less li they're more likely to keep their mouth shut and never even ask at all. There is absolutely no social or educational benefit to acting surprised when to someone asks a question. Um, create an environment where people can continue to ask these questions. Um, a tip from Julia Evans is, if you are surprised, don't act like it. And if you need to turn that energy of being surprised, turn it into enthusiasm to answer their question and that they even asked it in the first place. Know your audience. Who are you speaking to? Who's your audience? Do you understand anything about their background? Um, you have to gear what you're saying to who you are talking to. I talk about this all the time in my day job. Um, I can't explain the back-end concept to a front-end engineer in the same way. They're just going to respond to it differently. Uh, and so I constantly ask when someone's creating anything, talking about anything, who's the audience in this conversation? Leave space. So the Python community really started the Pac-Man role. It's like when you're standing in a group of people, you always leave a room for one person to enter the conversation. It, it's giving them explicit permission to join the group. What about in virtual spaces, on conversations online? Are you giving someone the opportunity to join that group, to come into the conversation, and not only listen, but be a part of that conversation. Um, take cues from people when they're having conversation. If they're trying to respond, and like nobody is like really reacting to the response, maybe respond to them directly so that they know that they aren't like left out of that conversation. And also think about the dynamics exist, you know, power dynamics in a conversation. If the person who's leading that conversation in a way has more power, what is it like for someone with less power to be a part of that conversation? Empathy. At this point, I sometimes feel like empathy is a little bit overused, but I still think it's really important. You know, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. 
I don't think you can be a really good storyteller without empathy. Will it be a good story for some? Yes, of course. But to a broader audience, probably not. We are all new to things once upon a time. It's kind of hard sometimes to remember, though. Uh, time happens, you gain other experience, so the next time you're new, it's a little different. But we have to remember that. Um, you aren't always going to feel the feelings that the people on the other side have, but we have to find shared experiences that we can relate to so that we can still have some of that empathy. I see two types of failure here. One, empathy failure, so the problems caused by my words don't affect me, so therefore they're not a problem. Or two, which is related, uh, what I call beginner's mind failure. It's perfectly clear to me, I do not understand why you're not like understanding this. Side rant and related, um, Sarah May has this amazing talk called The Power of Agile. It's about the Agile Manifesto, the 17 white men that, that created this thing that kind of transformed how we work. Where are the people of color? There's not even a white woman. Where are the other gender minorities? Where is literally anyone else in this photo? It doesn't look like this room. And the real problem is they have the power and those power dynamics. And these stories of Agile were coming from a very specific demographic. It's total empathy failure to me. They, they like created something for a whole industry and it didn't even reflect what the industry was. But I'll go back to the, the fifth tip. But go watch, Sarah's talk is amazing. Really great about power dynamics. When you mention a technology, explain it, especially in a broad audience. Um, you might have noticed something when I explained Vercel and Netlify earlier. Like, I did that without saying, asking who knows what Vercel or Netlify. I didn't like even ask, I just did it. I just explained it. Don't assume that people know everything you know. Um, who has used whatever, okay, speaker says that, everybody, like 75% of the room raises their hands and they go on with the talk without ever explaining it and the 25% of the room has no idea what they're talking about. Like, don't do that. Just explain it. Don't even ask the question sometimes. If it's a smaller group, maybe ask if it needs to be explained. Don't assume that maybe because someone has less experience they don't know. Maybe they actually do know, and you're just wasting their time. Um, your experience is your superpower. Use it. Use it in these explanations. And the best stories tap into emotions and pain, especially when you've had, like, previous project you might have been working on, had a lot of a lot of stories of emotion and pain, and you want to convey that to the next group working on it, like, you know, those are great. Somehow, um, we have forgotten that developers, what developers do best is learn. It's something that uh, Jeff Atwood said in a Coding Horror uh, blog post many years ago. We have to give them the opportunity to learn. Um, sometimes we don't even give them the opportunity. Younger builders of the future are building on things like serverless, when they've never experienced what came before that. But the thing is, fut like the future generations care what the past generations think. They actually do care. They may act like they're too cool for it, but they're not. Um, they look to them to understand the intent to guide them. So we need to say what the intent was, not just this is how we solve this thing, like why? Why is it like this? Um, and, it, and that pain and emotion is like really good to understand part of that. So those are the six tips. No feigning surprise, know your audience, leave space, empathy, explain technologies, and no badges, but communicate that emotion and pain. And I just want to touch on one last thing before the end, the future. Uh, where, where should we, like, why, how should we think about this going forward? As more products, tools, open source projects are released, the need for storytelling and, uh, and communication of ideas is only increasing. Um, I look at front-end engineering world, for example, which I like sit very adjacently on, and I swear like every day, multiple times a day, there's a new shiny tool launched. And I have no context sometimes for how I should think about this tool in the broader scope at times, unless I really spend a lot of time looking into this. And we just need to make that easier to better understand what is the problem this is solving? How did previous things not solve these problems? Like, more informed solutions come from understanding the past. We learn from history. 
This talk has largely been focused on those with the wealth of knowledge, but at the same time, unless we know where we came from, how are we going to improve or build better projects in the future? We're constantly tackling new challenges, but they often have subtle differences from the old challenges at time, but they're always related in unique and interesting ways. And I think if we build, want to build better products, projects with an understanding of the past, we need you know, to be more well-informed. And well-informed so, uh, projects that solve problems in new and unique ways with a diversity of many experiences, I believe, is the future. Um, and so it all comes down to storytelling and communication. So I just want to end on a question. Are there stories you can go tell uh, that you may have thought of while this talk? Um, I would love to hear them from you later. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>